Welcome everybody to Rust packaging tutorial. Uh, yeah, um, I'm Fabio Valentini, as you can see. My nickname is Deckerthorpe, practically everywhere. So you can you can reach me on all those social media if you have questions. Yeah, um, yeah, and. I'm member of the Rust Special Interest Group in Fedora and member of the Packaging Committee and member of Engineering and Steering Committee. So you've probably seen me around. Okay, my plan for today would be to give a short to mid-length introduction into how Rust crates work and how uh, those properties translate into how we do Rust packaging in Fedora. So um, how we determine features and optional dependencies, build requires, requires, provides, what, uh, which of those things are done automatically and which you have uh, control over. And a short section about how, to, uh, how we map uh, semantic versioning to RPM version requirements because that's often some amount of confusion about that. Uh, second part is then um, looking at real world examples. Um, my plan would be to look at how does creating a Rust package from scratch look like, um, how to create an update for an existing package that can be updated independently uh, how to handle multi-crate or multi-package updates for crates that need to be updated together, how to correctly do uh, bindings for system li libraries, and how to create compatibility packages when you need to package two versions of a crate uh, together, or have both available in parallel. Yeah, how many of those examples we will cover will depend on how much time we have left at the end. But I have uh, prepared examples for all those cases. So yeah, we have enough to do, I think. OK, uh, if you want to follow along with the tutorial stuff later, you will need a, work it, a working packaging tool chain. And you will need Rust to RPM, preferably version 22, because it has lots of improvements over version 21. And you'll probably also need RPM auto spec, because we use that by default for all new Rust packages, and we are also converting existing ones to use it. So if, uh, okay, those are the package names, Fedora Packager, Rust to RPM, and RPM auto spec. If you install all three packages, you should be set for the tutorial. And you've got time to do that until the introduction is over. OK, any questions so far? I've got an eye on the chat. So if, you, if there's anything, just feel free to ask at any point. OK, perfect. Then let's start with the introduction. OK, first of all, uh, what happens when you build Rust crates? And what do the different build phases of RPM packages map to when you are talking about Rust code or Rust crates? In the prep phase, we do unpack the .crate files, which are basically uh, gzipped tarballs. And then we set up a local build environment for cargo with a cargo prep micro. Uh, we use generate build requires to generate build requires from create metadata automatically. So you don't have to take care of uh, OK, multiple people don't hear anything. OK, at least, at least some people have audio. OK, uh, then I'll, I'll continue. Uh, I've also put 
the slides online. They should be linked from the schedule, but I can also add a link to that in the chat. Give me a second. I wanted to do that at the beginning, but I forgot. Copy link. Okay. That should be a working link to the slides if you want to look at them yourself. Okay. Um, right. In the, in the build phase, we compile the crates with the specified feature flags. And that ensures that we only ship working code. So if you want to package a crate and it doesn't even compile, then the build fails. Um, and we run this on all architectures, even though the produced packages are no arch, uh, so architecture independent. But we ensure that they build on all architectures we support. Then in the install step, we copy create source code into uh, the path for the local registry, where we install all packages, uh, all crates that are packaged as RPMs. And any binaries that are produced by the crates are installed into the directory for binaries in the build root. And when enabled, there's a check section where we compile the unit tests and run all the tests. So there's usually unit tests and integration tests and tests that are embedded in the documentation. And they are all built and run during the check uh, section by default. OK, what do crate files look like? Uh, Cargo.toml is mandatory. Uh, that's project metadata and dependencies. And that's basically what uh, we use for generating the Rust packages. Then there's, of course, the source code itself. And sometimes the crates need some dynamic behavior at build time, for example, to generate some code. And those are. Uh, controlled via build RS, basically uh, build scripts that are run during build time. Then there's optional stuff, license files, readme files, uh, source code for tests, examples, benchmarks, and often some data files that are used as inputs for uh, unit tests. Uh, and yeah, you saw it correctly, license files are, and are technically optional, but uh, we uh, technically require them for packaging them for Fedora. So, and most upstream projects are good with including license files. And if they don't, then if you, if you poke them, they do the right thing. Because we need the license files for the source code to be redistributable. OK, this is what, what the file looks like. Uh, I hope it's not too small so I can see a little bit at least. Uh, the package table in the crate defines the project metadata, and we have some stuff in there that we use. For example, the, the name of the crate we map to a package name. The version is used to uh, populate the version field for the RPM, though we do some translation of characters that are valid in semantic versioning, but not valid in RPM versions. And we use the description string to populate the summary and the description tags of the RPM. And we use the license string, which is SPDX expression by default, to populate the license tag in the RPM package. And one nice simplification here that we managed to do recently is because Fedora now allows SPDX license expressions in uh, license tags. We just use SPDX expression from upstream directly instead of translating it to the equivalent Fedora expression. Uh, basically, it's just the hyphen that's problematic from semantic versioning, and we translate that to the tilde character. I'm not sure if there are other cases as well, but that's the main one. So if you have pre-releases, those are uh, in, in semantic version in syntax, those are separated with a hyphen. And in RPM syntax, we use the tilde character. So that's the most important one we do for 
uh, uh, version string compatibility. But we have macros to do that and automation, so you don't have to do that by hand. OK, then just uh, to explain the default layout of Rust source code that's published to crates.io, uh, you usually have a source directory with other directories and Rust source files and unit tests. And the unit tests can use private APIs, and they are compiled into a single test runner when running the tests. Then you have source uh, slash lib.rs, which is the main entry point for libraries, and source slash main.rs or source slash bin slash any rs for applications, if that's optional. And then we have a directory for tests and one directory for example code and one directory for benchmarks. And the files under tests are integration tests. They don't have access to internal APIs of the, of the crate. They only can use public APIs. So those are basically integration tests for testing the public API. Uh, then there's example code in the examples directory. Uh, that's only compiled when running the test suite, but it's not run. So basically, the tests sh just ensure that the examples are up to date and they're still, still compile. And there's also sometimes benchmarks. But um, for RPM packaging purposes, those files are unused because we neither compile nor run the benchmarks. Right, and those are the defaults, and you can customize everything about this by setting explicit settings in Cargo DOM. So if a crate you want to package has some weird directory layout or puts files in weird places, you might need to look at the Cargo DOM metadata uh, for how the source code is structured. But that's usually the default. OK, and then we need to map the semantic versioning strings that are used by Rust crates to strings that for RPM versions that are compatible. And that usually involves things like uh, pre-releases, though we don't often package pre-releases. But uh, yeah, as I said, we need to replace the hyphen character, which uh, denotes a pre-release in semantic versioning with the tilde character that denotes a pre-release in RPM versions. And that works both ways. So the conversion is lossless. And we also need to do, uh, do this conversion both ways when running automation for packaging. Um, there's also sometimes additional information that's in the version strings. Uh, for example, when you're packaging bindings for C libraries, they sometimes put additional metadata into the version. Like in this case, this is the version of the bindings for libcurl. And this is used to denote which version uh, of the curl library is bundled if you want to build with vendor dependencies. But since we don't do that, in Fedora packages, we drop this uh, extra metadata suffix. And we also don't need it for dependency resolution. So we usually patch this out because it's not information that's useful for us or anything that we need. OK, now uh, something that's a bit less obvious. Uh, Rust crates can define a set of features and optional dependencies, which can be on by default or off by default. So there's a set of default features, which can depend on some optional dependencies. And then there's non-default features that also can depend on optional dependencies. And we need to map that to RPM concepts somehow uh, to keep the metadata and integrate dependencies correct. Uh, yeah, there's also 
a mode when you compi can compile Rust crates with no default features, which basically turns off all default and all non-default features. So you have to keep that in mind when you build crates. And especially when you build applications, because sometimes people will yell at you, oh, this application in Fedora doesn't support feature X and feature Y, and then you look at it and you see, okay, that would be optional features that we don't have enabled in our packaging. But if you enable the optional features, then uh, those uh, features are supported in the binaries that we build. So you have to sometimes look out for that. Uh, yeah, and that's also important, which features and optional dependencies are enabled affect functionality of the crate and sometimes also behavior. Uh, because it can affect conditional compilation. So it can depend on, uh, can affect which code is compiled and which code is included. Uh, yeah, features and optional sub uh, optional dependencies are then mapped to RPM sub packages by uh, Rust to RPM. And we have uh, automatic generation of virtual provides and requires between those sub packages. So you don't have to do that yourself. Um, yeah, that last point is important. The set of features and optional dependencies can change with every version of a crate. It's usually not good to remove a, a, a feature in a patch release, but theoretically uh, any version of a crate can change the set of features and dependencies. So it's important to rerun Rust to RPM for every new version because only that ensures that there are RPM sub packages for all the features and optional dependencies. And if you don't do that, yeah, right. If you don't rerun Rust to RPM, that can result in broken packages because then uh, if the crate includes a new optional dependency, but you don't generate a sub package for it, then the feature sub package will have a broken dependency because you don't have generated the sub package for the, uh, for the optional dependency. Yeah, right. And OPM autospec really comes in handy here because you don't have to restore the change log for the package when you regenerate it with Rust to OPM for a new version. So that's really cut down the work we need to do for updating things to new versions. Right. Uh, then we have, right, I already mentioned that uh, we generate RPM spec files for crates which do a test build during the build phase. So we ensure that we don't ship any broken code. So anything that we ship should compile. If it built in this crate, it should build when you build anything against it. Uh, yeah, and we need dependencies and build dependencies that are specified in Cargo Tomo available during the build. Otherwise, you don't have the dependencies that are necessary for the build. And these are automatically generated by the cargo generate build requires macro. And when you run package builds that use your crate, then those uh, dependencies are generated for the Rust name of the crate devil package. So that handles transitive dependencies, basically. OK, and by default, we also run the test suite for package crates when possible. Uh, yeah, just, just to make sure that we actually ship working code, basically. And uh, we've also caught lots of bugs this way. Sometimes uh, code claims to be compatible with certain architectures, but when you run the test suite, you see, okay, this crashes on big Endian architectures because they hard code byte order in some integer bytes or stuff like that. And then you've got to find a bug report for that. And yeah, sometimes that's not fun. But in the end, uh, that makes sure that we actually ship code that should work. And you don't get that benefit when you build with vendored dependencies because you don't run the test suite for all your vendor dependencies. Um, right, and the dependencies that are needed for running the tests are not included when the dependency generator runs for the development package. 
because the tests are only one run when you build the crate, but not when you include the crate in the build for some other package. Okay, then we have automatic uh, generation of virtual provides that are uh, standardized. Um, for example, the sub package with just the suffix devel gets uh, virtual provides of crate in parentheses, the num name of the crate, providing the version and the release. And if for the plus default, you get the crate with the default features and plus some feature bar, you get uh, and provides for the crate full with the feature bar. And those are what are referenced by automatically generated requires by dependency generators and by the build requires generator. Okay, then we need to map semantic version requirement syntax to RPM. You can specify that your crate needs version 0 0.1 of package of crate foo. Name feature format. Uh, um, it's based on upstream. That's based on a syntax that's used for feature dependencies in cargo itself. So it's not really something that we invented. It's because, yeah, it's, it's based on what upstream can do. Uh, I'll, I can show an example later. Uh, right. So if, if your crate specifies a dependency on foo 0 .0, uh, 0.1, that's equivalent to using uh, caret 0 0.1 or equivalent to using tilde 0 0.1. Those all map to, I want greater than version 0 0.1.0 and I want smaller than 0 0.2. Basically this says, I want any version that's compatible with 0 0.1 of this crate. So uh, the RPM dependency that's generated is this one. It says, right, I want any version compatible with 0 0.1, which means anything between 0, 1, 0, and anything that's smaller than 0, 2, 0. And we need that um, trailing tilde character there, because otherwise uh, pre-releases of 0 to 2 would be included here. And for post 1.0 releases, the tilde style is not equivalent. And that sometimes causes problems, because upstream projects not may not really realize that it doesn't do the same thing or they uh, do something weird in their dependencies. So 1.1 and uh, caret 1.1 still resolves as you expect to foo bigger or equal than 1.1.0 and smaller than 2.0.0 but the tilde 1.1 resolves to dependencies between 1.1.0 and 1.2.0. So that is a stricter uh, requirement than the, the one with the carrot or the without the uh, specification. Uh, that sometimes causes problems for us because we don't really expect packages to do this. And we update packages to versions that are uh, compatible according to semantic versioning. But if crates use the tilde requirement for post 1.0 uh, releases, that breaks. Because we uh, might update a package from, let's say we update foo from 1.1 to version 1.3. Those are still, still compatible, but the project restricts to using foo between 1.1 and 1.2, and then uh, there is a broken dependency there. So. If you see a package that uses a tilde version requirement for any post 1.0 release, you should remove that because it breaks the assumptions we make for packaging and especially for updating versions that should be compatible according to semantic versioning. Okay, now let's look at an example. We have some metadata here. We have a, uh, 
crate with the name foo and the version 101. We have a dependency bar in version 102 that's optional. We have dependencies for running the tests. We call that foo test data in this example. We need version uh, 0.1. And we have two features. We have the default features, which has no dependencies, and we have a foo bar feature, which depends on the bar optional dependency. And you see, you can uh, specify which versions depend on which other versions or which uh, optional dependencies. So in this case, the foo bar feature depends on the bar optional dependency. And you'll see in a moment that uh, the RPM provides and requires that are generated by Rust tooling reflect that one-to-one. -one. Right. OK, since this package, uh, since this crate has no dependencies by default, it will just get a dependency on Rust packaging, which are all the RPM packaging tools for Rust, and a dependency on Cargo, and a dependency on the Rust compiler. So just to, to run the test build and for everything in the packaging machinery to work. And if the tests are enabled, you'll get also a generated build requires on the food test data that's specified here. And that will look something like build requires create food test data slash default greater or equal ones uh, zero dot one dot zero with create food test data slash default smaller o to o tilde and now you know why this stuff is automatically automatically generated because it would be really error prone to do that by hand. Right and the provides and requires for the different build packages will, will look like this. Uh, the development package, which contains the crate source code, will generate uh, provides for the crate name and the version. Then there's a sub package for the default features that will depend on the crate with no features, and it will provide the crate with the default features, and yeah, and so on and so on. The crate, uh, the sub package for the bar feature will require the main crate source code. It will require the bar crate in this case, because we specified that here. And it will provide the crate with the bar feature. And the sub package for the full bar feature will require the crate source code. And it will require the bar feature. And it will provide the full bar feature. So you can see we map the concepts that are present in uh, cargo metadata to RPM uh, sub packages and dependencies between those sub packages. So we basically uh, preserve all the information that's there in the upstream project. And you have some, uh, some ways where, uh, in which you can uh, affect generation of those sub packages. If, for example, you have an optional dependency that you want, uh, don't want to package it because it has missing dependencies and it's not used by what you need to do, so you can disable some of those generated sub packages. Okay. Are there any questions so far? Was I talking too fast? <laughs> okay because I assumed that it would take me longer to go through the introduction. But that's perfect, because we now have lots of time for the examples and for uh, questions, if you have any. OK. Um, I just show my last slide, because then I can close the presentation. Uh, Basically, this is just, yeah, if you have any questions with uh, regards to Rust packaging, uh, there's lots of ways how you can reach the Rust SIG uh, or Rust packages in general. Um, there's the Fedora Rust channel on Matrix, which is bridged to the Fedora Rust channel on LibraChat IRC. 
there's a mailing list where you can send questions that are if nobody's uh, online in the matrix or I IRC channels. And if you want to look at Rust RPM and the packaging macros we use for Rust packaging, uh, those are hosted on Pagure, Pagure, however you want to pronounce it. Uh, those are clickable links if you want to take a look or file bugs if you think something's broken. Right. Um, now, let me see if I can share my screen instead of the presentation. And I hope that things will be big enough to see them on the stream. But, uh, why Rust for RPM is written in Python and not in Rust? Um, two reasons. It was first uh, the first version was written in Python, and it's basically stayed that way. Uh, rewriting it in Rust would be possible, and it would allow us to use some algorithms and libraries that are also used by upstream cargo. But it would also in, uh, introduce a bootstrap problem because you need you need the Rust tooling to build Rust to RPM, but you don't have the Rust tooling because you don't have Rust to RPM. So having it in Python uh, makes it possible to start from zero, basically, without a bootstrap problem. Yeah, um, writing it in Rust wouldn't wouldn't provide much advantage other than uh, using the same libraries for some, some things. Like right now we have our own parser for semantic versioning uh, syntax, and if you if we wrote it in Rust, we could use the same library that Cargo uses for doing that. But uh, basically, the one we have right now is uh, good enough. So all the bugs are fixed. So it, it should work in all cases. OK. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. All the known bugs are fixed. <laughs> OK. Um, let me see if I can share my screen somehow. OK. Let me move it there so I can see the chat. Um, okay, uh, the first example I would like to show you would be updating, yeah, it's 4K. Let's see. Um, I've looked at uh, bugs for new versions that we have for Rust crates, and one of the nice ones we could look at is the 30 JSON crate. Oops, of course, on camera, I make typos. Uh, clone. Thanks, Miro. Uh, OK, uh, let's look at that. So OK, this is probably too small, but I can do this. We have a changelog file, because this package predates RP motor spec. So that contains uh, historical changelog data. Uh, we have the spec file and we have the sources file. Yeah, standard package. Um, okay, let's see if that works. Three hundred percent. Three hundred percent is really big, but I hope you can read this. Oops. Oops. So, is that big enough? Perfect. OK, um, uh, we can go through the spec file to see uh, how the stuff I've been talking about looks in a real spec file. Uh, we have the condition for running checks or not. Uh, we have the name of the crate defined at the top. We have the version. We have the package name, we are using RPM autospec. Uh, the summary is generated from cargo metadata. 
the license is generated from cargo metadata. In this case, um, we haven't updated this package since SPDX ex expressions were allowed. So uh, previously we put a disclaimer here, upstream license uh, is MIT or Apache 2.0, and then we had a Fedora equivalent license expression down here. Um, then we have a macro for the URL of the great sources. Um, we have the description in a separate macro that's also generated from the same description in the uh, cargo tumble file. Then we have the devil sub package, which contains all the source code of the crate. Uh, it's uh, no arch because it's architecture independent because there's only source code in here. Uh, yeah, we have license files, docs, and this line here is the path to the source code of the crate in the build route. Then we have a sub package for the default feature set. We have a sub package for alloc feature, which means uh, you need a global allocator for this to work. Uh, some other sub packages for optional features uh, uh, using uh, order preserving hash maps, for example, which is not on by default. Yeah, on and so on and so on. We have the prep stage where we unpack the crate and set up the build environment. We have automatic generation of build requires. We run the build, we install the source code, we run the tests. So the actual meat of the spec file is really simple. Uh, uh, building Rust crates is relatively straightforward and quite standardized because when you upload crates to crates.io registry, there um, need to fulfill some uh, minimum requirements for standardization. So uh, the things we need to do to build the package is quite simple. And uh, there, uh, I think there's work ongoing in RPM that we can also automatically generate those sub packages at some point in the future, because that's most of the content of the spec file is just uh, expanded templates. And those are not really interesting. Right. Okay, then let's see. I know there was version 1083 released a few days ago, and we can try to update that. And I have that already open here. And the Go macros already generate sub packages. I thought RPM doesn't have the features to do that yet. I mean, you can write macros to do it, but yeah, you can use macros to generate the sub package definition, but I think there's, um, it, there's some ideas how to um, generate sub packages automatically without having to use macros. Yeah, that would make our job a bit simpler. But in the meantime, we could use macros to generate uh, those expanded template stuff, sub packages. But basically, just not, not really important. At least that way, you can see the contents of the sub packages. Uh, OK. Um, it needs to uh, go to the metadata file because the dependency generators read that file. So you need that in every sub package. Right. Because um, the dependency generators run on that file, generate the necessary requirements in inter package dependencies. And that only works if you have that file in the package as well. And it's ghost because uh, you don't actually, uh, because otherwise it might, um, yeah, you, you don't actually need, need to file, but you, you can mark it as ghost. Um, 
the the actual file is only whoops, sorry for the inception uh, the own the actual cargo toml file is included only in the devel sub package because it's under that directory and it's ghost included in all other sub packages for the dependency generators does that make sense yeah right they only process the crates if they can find the cargo toml file you get really weird error messages if you accidentally re remove the cargo toml file <laughs> yeah okay now look look at sorry json uh, it's one of probably most most used crate packages we have in fedora because it's the de facto uh, standard 30 and uh, deserialization and serial, serialization library for JSON. Um, now let's see if you can update that package. Okay, let's run Rust to RPM. And we need, uh, we may want the S flag because that actually stores the crate file and we don't have to download it manually. Uh, the A flag would enable RPM autospec, but that's automatically detected if you're already using it. We can include the P flag if we want to package, uh, if we want to patch create metadata before uh, building the package. Uh, we can do that in this case, although I don't think we need to make any modifications here. And then one zero eighty three because you give it the crate name and the crate version that you'd want to generate for. But it defaults to the latest version, so we can omit that. And since version 22, we, uh, it automatically determines the crate name as well, so we can omit all that. So it's just rust to rpm sp uh, Then you get an editor where you can see the crate metadata and in this case, we don't need to edit any of that because it's, it's all fine. Nothing to um, all compatible with what we're doing. So we just close that. You can see and found a valid spec file for the 30 JSON crate, uh, 30 JSON crate and used uh, 30 JSON and it used the latest stable version and it generated the spec file for us. And I don't think that text editor shows git diff. No, it doesn't. Git diff. OK. Well, we can see we generated the spec file with Rust to RPM 22. And last time we ran it, uh, we used Rust uh, to RPM 21. But that's not really important for the diff. Uh, one of the things that changed is that we expand the crate macro in the name so you can easier, easier copy paste stuff. Uh, the version string is different and we no longer translate SPDX expression in license tag, but we use upstream specification directly. And that's all the changes that there are. The um, remaining spec file is identical between version 1.0.82 and 1.0.83. Now we build the source RPM file and build against the oldest supported Fedora release and run it with post install to make sure all the dependencies for our non-default optional features are also present. If you don't do that, you might push a package that builds but doesn't install. So I tend to do um, mock builds with post install locally, just to make sure that packages not only build, but also install when you build them in Koji. Okay, that should be pretty quick. Refreshing at the um, repository data, installing the default Rust dependencies and the dependency generators. Now it's installing the dependencies for the crate itself were auto-generated. Now it's running the build step. Mm. 
Yeah, Fedora 35 doesn't have Rust Appium uh, version 22 yet. It's a crit path package, so it needs 14 days in uh, testing. <laughs> Yeah, now it's building the unit tests. Uh, enable lo repo local. Uh, sometimes it's your friend, but in this case, it doesn't help you because I don't uh, have a build root override submitted for it. So it wouldn't actually get uh, Rust RPM version 22 if you use the local repo. Okay, of course this takes longer when you look at it. And that's just a wall of text from compiler output. Yeah. Building integration tests right now. So it shouldn't be long. It always reminds me of that one comic where you see the two programmers standing on uh, their chairs and fighting with swords and somebody comes by and asks them, what are you doing? Stuff's compiling. Okay, go on. Okay, now it's finished. Uh, you can see here at the end, it's running all the tests from the test suite. And then you see output of the dependency generators. For example, you can see here, it's processing the sub package for the alloc feature. And it requires the 30 alloc feature and it provides the package name with a lock somewhere. Uh, it's wall of text, not easy to find things in here, but no error messages. And the post install step also worked. It installed all build sub packages with no errors. We get everything installed, everything built, complete, finished, run, perfect. Now we use that package, new sources, so JSON. Of course, you shouldn't do that now. <laughs> Source upload security. Now we look at the diff to make sure everything's okay. We have new git ignore entry. We have the very small changes to the actual spec file, basically only version increased from 1082 uh, to 1083. And the new entry for the source file. Commit that. Uh, update to version 1083 fixes Red Hat Bugzilla number. Let me just look that up. Rust JSON. Harm, harm. There's only one thing that's slower than Rust compile times, and it's Bugzilla. Okay, let's copy that bug number, paste it in here, commit. Uh, the command was fat package new sources survey JSON 1083.crate. But that uploads stuff to Fedora server, so you shouldn't run that step. I'm just doing it to show you how I'm updating the crates now. Okay. Uh, that should give us a nice new commit. Yeah, update to version 1083, fixes Red Hat Bugzilla something something. You see, I've also pushed the update to version 182 a few, three weeks ago. But now I'm just doing git push, fed package build to actually submit the update. Yeah, 
And that's not really important now because I just wanted to use a real world package update to show you during the tutorial. Um, to run which command only locally? Um, you can use uh, fed package new sources dash dash offline, I think. That doesn't upload the sources. Yeah. If you don't have um, access to the package, then you need to do that, that uh, this way. Okay. Then that's building for rawhide. And now I need fed package switch branch. Fedora 36, merge the change from rawhide we just did and push and fed package build. And because I don't want to type all that every time I've got a bash alias that does the same thing. Now it's also building for Fedora 36 and I'll open another tab. The package switch branch Fedora 35, git merge Fedora 36, git push for the package build. Um, yeah. Merging the same change to Fedora 35 branch, pushing it to git and launching the build and all everything takes a few seconds, but now it's also building for Fedora 35. Okay, we can look at this later. Uh, in this case, I've just updated from 1.0.82 to 1.0.83. So uh, I know that nothing requires exactly this. So for, uh, for cases like that, uh, you don't need to, uh, you don't really need to check if something has an odd dependency like that. And in this case, I'm also 99.99% sure that nothing does stupid stuff like that because I update the 30 JSON package like every two weeks and nothing breaks. So, yeah. Uh, but yes, for other packages, you need to check sometimes. Um, I can look at another package. Yeah, I can uh, move on to the next example where I can show you that um, that sometimes is, oops, why is that so big? Um, uh, I can show you how to check for reverse dependencies. Um, okay, next example I wanted to show you, or in this case, I'll show you another example earlier. That's uh, for the same deserialization, serialization framework, not the JSON support, but the YAML support. That package, uh, that crate recently got a few new upstream releases. Now let's check what the package looks like. Standard package as well, just spec file sources, readme change log, no patches, nothing. Uh, okay, why is this small again? 300%. Uh, just like the Previous package, nothing special in here. All standard package with no need for manual modifications. Let's run Rust to RPM to update it to the new version. All done. Reload. All looks good. Now look. Let's look at the diff between the old and the new version. And now you see a problem because the old version was 0825 and the new version is 094. So that's an incompatible upgrade because it changes the leading number. 
And in that case, there's a few things you can do, but uh, let me see. I use this uh, bash script to check reverse dependencies. Great up so the YAML. And now you see there's a long list of packages that depend on Sardi YAML version 0 0.8. So if you updated Sardi YAML from 0 0.8 to 0 0.9, you break all those because they require smaller than 0 0.9. Uh, right, and I can show the expanded version of those uh, of that bash script. Uh, No, uh, it doesn't really need to do that. It just, the script just checks which packages require the current version. And if you want to do an incompatible version bump, then you check which packages require the current version. So you know which packages would be broken if you updated it right now. Uh, yeah, right. That's. It's basically just uh, two uh, repo query commands for DNF that check rawhide and rawhide source repos for which packages require the uh, create packages without features and with any features, which is that plus star devil, and then sorts sorts, sorts the results. Uh, I've pushed that. Um, script somewhere. I can link to it or I can, uh, yeah, I have, I have it on GitHub somewhere. Uh, let me paste that into the chat. Okay. See you. Okay, Oops. okay uh, now we know that we can't update this package to version 0 0.9 if we don't want to break a whole lot of packages. So we need to, oops, we need to think about how to handle that. And in this case, because the list of packages is quite long and I've already looked at the change log entry for 0 0.9 version, and there's quite a lot of uh, incompatible API changes. So porting all those packages to the new version is not really feasible for downstream packages. <laughs> yeah, adblock is sometimes blocking too many things. Um, right, in this case, we see that we can't really update this to version 0 0.9 yet unless we also make some other changes. And in this case, I could show you a next case, which is creating a compatibility package for an older crate version. In this case, we want to package both version 0 0.8 and 0 0.9. So they're available in parallel. Crates can uh, depend on whichever they need. So we have both of them available and that's probably going to be necessary as some applications already started using the new version and lots of things is still using the old version. So unless we want to block updates for the packages that use the new version, we need to package both. And that's basically one of the things I wanted to show anyway. So let's see. Rest to RPM help. Yeah, right. Uh, once all the packages have upgraded to depend on the new version, we can uh, remove the old one from the uh, from Fedora. So it's basically just uh, helping us move forward while retaining backward compatibility for crates that don't support the new version yet. 
Okay, now we can look at Rust to RPM help output and we see that there should be one option that's interesting for generating compatibility packages for older versions, which is the suffix option. And we also need to know which version to package from the zero point int branch, because we can't just let it auto detect the latest one because we don't want the latest one. Okay, now which version from the zero point int branch we want, we go to crates dot io and to the page for the 30 gamma crate and to the version tab and you see that the latest version from the 0 0.8 branch is 0 0.8.26 so we run rust to rpm for 30 yaml for 0 0.8.26 with a package suffix of 0 0.8 generated spec file. Let's look at that. Small again, interesting. Yeah. So it basically generates the same spec file that we had for this uh, 30YAML package before we ran the uh, update for the 0 0.9 update. The only thing it changes is that it puts a suffix after the package name both in the name of the spec file and in the package names. So since all the sub packages are namespaced in that name, both packages are also parallel installable. And the location on the file system where those files are installed are also namespaced by both crate name and version so they also don't conflict at the file system level. So you can basically have packages where some parts of the dependency tree require the new version, some parts require the old version, but because everything is namespaced correctly, uh, that w just works. Which is also how cargo upstream works. So we don't uh, so we don't break things that work upstream. Uh, okay, that was pretty simple. Not really much to talk about here. Or other questions? No questions? Nothing in the Q&A tab? Right. Uh, okay, let's check on our 30 JSON builds. Looks like they're all going nicely. We have zero failed tasks, five tasks that are done, one that's still pending. And similar here, similar here. Okay, just still taking a bit of time. Um, <clears throat> okay, um, right. And once you want to submit those updates, in this case for 30 YAML 0 0.9.4 and the compatibility package for the 0 0.8 branch, uh, you should put those into the same update. So uh, they're updated uh, atomically, that there's no point in time at which packages are broken. They either, either see only the 0 0.8. Oh no. <clears throat> Uh, I'm also seeing some weird flashes on my screen. Maybe that's affecting the video in some way. But I think the stream is still working. Okay, either way. <clears throat> um, right, and when, when you're submitting that update from 0 0.8 to 0 0.9, including the parallel installable compatibility package for the 0 0.8 branch, you should submit those two builds in the same update atomically. So either stuff sees the 0 0.8 version or the 0 0.8 compatibility version, but there is no point in time at which packages only see 0 0.9. So there's no uh, transitionary period where stuff is broken. Uh, right. <coughs> 
Let's see. Next example. Um, I have prepared two more examples or three. One for updating multi uh, for creating multi crate updates, where you need to update two or more crates together for them to work correctly, or um, packaging bindings for system libraries correctly, or packaging a new package, uh, packaging a new crate that hasn't been packaged before. Are there any preferences? But I think we have enough time to cover all of them. So it's not really important. Just regarding order in which to cover those. Yeah. I mean, uh, I can, I know that, for example, the 30 YAML crate version 0 0.9, oops, that's the wrong file. I know that this, oops, wrong application, 300%. Uh, the new version of CRDYAML requires a new dependency because it switched the, uh, the internal YAML parser from one library to another. It previ previously used a Rust implementation, and now it uses an implementation that's based on uh, libyaml. And that's not packaged yet for Fedora, so we need to package that anyhow. We can look at that. So basically, that would be make a new directory for a new package name. And uh, well, no, not really. You'll see why in a minute. Uh, Rust to RPM for uh, store the crate file for and save the YAML for the latest version. Okay. Now, let's look at this file. And now, the package description already tells you why we don't use system bindings. In this case, it's because it's libyaml source code transpiled to Rust. So it's not really C code anymore. <laughs> C code transpiled to Rust by some automated tool. <clears throat> and yeah, you can see there's some stuff in here that looks a bit weird because it ships two binaries that sound like they're only used for running tests or something. But the rest looks normal. Okay. Now let's let's check whether this package actually builds. RPM build, build source, Rust um, and save libyaml spec. Now let's build that on mock. Okay, let's see what it does. If it works, if it doesn't. I already know the answer because I looked at doing all those examples yesterday to make sure the demos all work. Okay, it failed. Now let's scroll up why it failed. Looks like the build itself finished successfully. Mm, let's see. Yeah. Build and install, extracting debug info information, all finished successfully. But somewhere in executing the check phase, so in running or building the test suite, it failed. And we'll see why in a moment. Because it, there's 
this error message. And you might see this in some cases when you're packaging Rust crates. So you start to know what this message means at some point. You see, fail to resolve use of undeclared crate or module un unsafe libyaml test suite. So that means uh, this test code tried to import another crate, which wasn't there and wasn't also specified in cargo toml. So that basically means one of two things, either upstream is broken, which I know is not the case here, but let's look at the source code for this crate on GitHub. I'll make that bigger in a second. Oops. Okay. We have this project on GitHub. And if you look at this, there's, you see, oh, this is a workspace. That means there's multiple crates in here. And when you look at the tests, data, directory, there's another crate in here. Unsafe libyaml test suite. Oh, right, that's the one it failed to find when running the tests. But you see this crate is not published. So it's not available for us for packaging. So basically, we are out of luck for running the test suite here because uh, the dependencies for the test suite are not published. Um, right, so in this case, we'd go into the spec file and change this flag so that we don't run the tests, add a comment. Uh, um, what should the comment be? Test data for is not published or something like that. And it's, it's really important to add a comment to why you're disabling tests because you know, the next person who will look at the package won't know why you disabled them. Okay, now let's try again build the source package and run the build again. That should be a bit faster now because it doesn't install test dependencies. And that should work now. Compiling the library, extracting debug info, installing the library. Yeah, it's all done. Yeah. Okay. Now we still have one small problem because we don't really want those test binaries generated if you're not even running the tests. And there's a trick you can use for that. Um, let's rerun Rust to RPM. Um, with generating a patch, so with the dash p flag, and we can add a setting that we don't want automatic detection of binaries. Save that and exit. And now you see that we have automatically included a patch here. And we add a comment. Uh, do not build unused test binaries. And we need to update the test data is not published, something like that. And now we have those mm, two small modifications for the automatically generated spec file. And that should result in a package that doesn't build any binaries. 
and build successfully. Okay, bye. <laughs> Okay, perfect. Uh, saw spec spec. Uh, yeah, I know, but I don't really. There's not really a reason to do it that way. And I, I have, um, I have bash aliases. Uh, for this long command, I usually just type mf35, and it does the same thing. So I save a lot of typing by doing it that way. <clears throat> but yeah, I, I know that you can build from the spec file directly. Um, Right, but it's it's also not really necessary to build uh, uh, the source RPM in MOOC because uh, the Rust toolchain for building packages is compatible between version uh, Fedora 35, 36, and Rawhide. So a source package that you generate on uh, Fedora 35 is compatible with building it on Rawhide. So if that wouldn't be the case, then building the source package in MOOC would be the only way to do it. But yeah, right. But in this case, uh, the Rust packaging uh, tools uh, don't affect don't affect the generated SRPM anyway. Yeah, right. Um, okay, that basically covers the creating a new package where we actually need to make some small modifications. Uh, Okay, what are the other examples I wanted to show you? Those are a bit more complicated as well. Uh, let's look at that one. Now, what, what does peak uses sound like? Any guesses? Yeah, that's bindings for Postgres. Uh, okay, um, so we'll need to make some modifications to this package because the patch we had for the last version no longer applies. So we need to redo some of those changes manually. Let's look at the package we have. Okay, there's some, some stuff here, which means we don't run the tests on 32-bit architectures. That looks a bit weird, but there's actually an explanation here. Uh, there's some patches here where we drop Windows-specific dependencies or stuff like that. Okay. That, oh, and here's also a change log. Okay, so this package doesn't uh, hasn't been converted to RPM Autospec yet. Okay, so let's run RPM auto spec convert and done. Now that automatically converted the package to RPM auto spec, which is nice because now we don't have to take care of the change log anymore. And now let's update to the new version. <coughs> Rust to RPM store create file and we need to apply some patches. Okay, let's look at the spec file. We have an optional dependency on package config. And we don't want that to be actually optional because we always use it. So we remove that and that should do it except if any packages use uh, explicitly use the package config flag 
the break. So we need to use, we need to preserve that feature flag. Otherwise packages might break. Now we have a conflict because we have an optional dependency uh, because we have a feature and an optional dependency. No, I think that should work. I'm not sure how I solved this yesterday. Either way, I think that should work this way. We have an, a new feature that has no dependencies that are with the same name as the previous optional dependency, just to make sure we don't break any packages that import this. Let's write that. Okay, now you can see we have actually, oops, what's that? All oh, right. We have more output from us to RPM this time. Here, there's a message that it dropped a target specific dependency on VC package, which is a Visual Studio support. So we don't need that on Linux. It renamed some deprecated uh, config file to a new name. It generated the spec file. It generated an automatically generated patch and it generated the patch that we wrote. So let's look at those files. All right. We have the automatically generated patch, which is a new feature with Rust to RPM version 22, that it automatically uh, drops dependencies on features uh, or dependencies on crates that are not needed for building on Linux. So in this case, it automatically removes a dependency on VC PKG, which is only used when the target environment is Microsoft Visual C. And we don't need that. And then we have our own patch that's here. Well, we, we preserve the package config feature flag, but we, don't, we make the build dependency on package config non-optional because we always build against the system Postgres library. Okay, now let's see what's different about the spec file. It's meaning the config file, yeah, the config, the config file specifies that we depend on libpq. That's not really interesting. Um, Fix metadata diff, that's the uh, patch we wrote. Then, okay, it removed. Uh, we need to look at if the test suite still passes because it was previously disabled for 32 bit architectures. Then, here's the usual stuff that changes with was to RPM 22. We have the expanded macro in the name. We have the update from 046 to 047. We have the SPDX expression in the license field now. And we have the new patches and some other minor changes that happened between Rust to RPM version that was used to build this last time, which was Rust to RPM 15. Okay, pretty old package. So there's some um, we updated the spec file template between version 15 and 22, so you, the diff is a bit bigger, but that's basically only fixes for typos or grammar in the description of the packages and stuff like that. And that's also interesting. Looks like the package didn't have license files when it was last built, but now we have uh, MIT and Apache license files and we have uh, docs as well. So that's good that uh, uh, the package now actually ships license files. Okay, now what do we still look, need to look at? There was another patch in this package that we didn't look at yet, which was the patch to make it build with a system library using package config by default. 
And that actually build, uh, patches one of the source files. So we'll still need to do that. So in this case, it patches the build.rs, so the build script. And you can see it removes conditional, com uh, conditionally compiled code for the case where we are not using package config. But we'll look at the source code again, because I know that this patch no longer applies because of upstream changes. So we'll remove that and extract the source code. And OK, let's look at the source code clear. And let's use git for generating our patches, because that's always nice. We add all files, make sure we don't uh, we don't generate changes based on line endings because some people still use Windows for developing. And add everything. And now we have everything prepared for writing the patch. We know we need to edit the build script now. What do we need to do? We need to make sure that the code that's executed when the package config feature was enabled is always executed because we made package config non-optional. OK, let's look for the main function, because the main function is what's actually run when you run the build script. Uh, there's a whole stuff about Homebrew and macOS. I think we'll remove that, because we don't need it. Config path, configured by VC package. No, 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 that's all not what we need. What's the main function? Here's the main function. Print, rerun if env changed pq lib static. No, we don't statically link. No, we don't build for different, uh, we don't do cross compiling, so we don't need to look at the target variable. Uh, No, that's not interesting for us either. That's all not interesting. We don't build against a different library path. Uh, we don't use that either. Configured by package config. That sounds interesting. OK. What does that do? Configured by package config function runs the probe library libpq uh, call from, from package config create. And that's actually the only thing that we'll need to do in the main function. Let's just copy that there and unwrap, which means we fail the main function if this fails. And I think we can drop everything else because we are just using package config in all cases. So, okay, I think that should do it. And let's check if that actually matches what I did a few days ago, because I know that what I did a few days ago works. Um, that's the patch. What does the file look like? Yeah, the file looks the same. OK, that's also what I did last time. So that should work. Uh, yeah, and if you're wondering, no, you don't really need to know how to do that when you build your first Rust package. That's just something I wanted to show. Yeah, there's sometimes, especially when you build bindings for system libraries, you might need to actually patch the build scripts to do the right thing. But in this case, the end result is actually pretty simple because it's just running package config to find the libpq library. And if, if it doesn't find it, it will fail the build. OK, let's see. Yeah, the diff is pretty big because we removed all the stuff for static linking and for Homebrew and for Microsoft Visual C environments and for macOS and all that stuff. And we only keep 
the support for building with package config. Let's write that commit unconditionally build uh, oh, I'm not really <laughs> uh, I forgot what I called that patch last time. Let's just check unconditionally use package config. Link against system lib pq. That should be pretty descriptive. Okay. Now let's go back to the workshop folder. Pq says, okay, kit. Format patch the last commit output directory where we want it. You can generate patches any way you want. They just need to apply. This is the way I like to do it because it makes it easier when there are multiple patches. Um, okay, now we need to look at the spec file again to make it actually include that patch. Uh, there is it. There it is. Make it big again. No idea what terminal remembers. 300% zoom, but text editor doesn't. Um, okay, for the automatically generated patch, we don't need a comment because that already explains what it does. For the manually created patch, we need to say make dependency on package config non optional. And then we have another patch where we patch the build script. Uh, unconditionally, ugh, let's just copy the patch text and the patch subject. Unconditionally use package config to link against system libpq. That's all good. Dependency on libpq development files is still there. Build dependency on libpq dependency, uh, de uh, development files is also there. Okay, looks good. Now, let's build that package. Let's see if our patches do what we want it to. Five post install. Okay. Good. No missing dependencies. Build finished successfully, packages installed successfully. Good. Now we can take a look here. We see it's running the test suite and some smoke tests and looks like everything passed. So that looks good. Now, what, what did we forget about? There was a comment that well, if you click on that issue link, you'll see that the test suite fails on 32-bit architectures. And in this case, I've actually looked at the failure. This was reported a while ago, but it's basically harmless because the tests hard code some uh, numbers that are only correct on 64-bit architectures, but the code itself should be fine. So it's just the tests that are broken, but the code itself is good. So we'll just, we'll keep that link. And let's, if, let's just do it that way. If arch ix64 or arm, then with check. So if we run on 32-bit architecture,
architectures, we don't run the tests. But if we are on 64-bit architectures, we do run the tests. And let's keep that link to the upstream issue and actually add a comment what the issue is about. Generated bind gen tests only work on 64-bit architectures. Basically, those are tests that are automatically generated for the Rust bindings, and they check stuff like um, struct layouts, struct sizes, and of course, uh, struct sizes are different on 64-bit architectures, especially if there's uh, pointers or integers or stuff like that in them. So it's uh, no surprise that those tests don't work on 32-bit architectures when they were uh, generated on 64-bit architectures. But I've looked at the generated code, and the generated code itself should be fine. OK. Now let's see. That's all good. We kept the comment about the failing tests. That's good. There's some optional white space that I don't really want. Where is it? There it is. Let's look at that again. OK, diff looks good now. Some stuff that's just generated by the newer Rust RPM version. And in this case, because uh, it's actually uh, a package that's kind of architecture dependent because it uh, bindings for system libraries, and in such cases, I sometimes launch scratch builds on Koji to make sure it actually builds on all architectures before I submit it. Um, let's build it for Fedora 35, because that also still has 32-bit ARM. And we can just launch that. And that should work. At least it worked two days ago. OK, let's move that here. And I think the 30 JSON builds all scratch build SRPM. Uh, that might work. But in this case, I launched a scratch build from an SRPM with uh, still uncommitted changes in the repository. I don't know if that command works if you have uncommitted changes. OK. Well, um, then it should work too, yeah. <clears throat> OK, let's see. The 30 JSON builds all finished successfully. Yeah, sure. <laughs> That's just the way I keep doing it, so. OK, and let's. Yeah. There's always three different things to do the same thing. So, uh, OK, let's look at Bodhi. I think I need to log in again for some reason. OK, you see there's quite a lot of pending updates in my account. Most of them Rust packages. Um, Let's see here. OK, the raw height update for the 30 JSON build we launched is already here. And now let's submit the Fedora 36 and 34 builds as well. There's 30 JSON, 36 and 35. Update to version 0.083. Uh, there shouldn't be any open bugs because the raw height build already closed. Closed it. We only need one stable karma because nobody gives karma for build root only packages anyway. Uh, right. OK. So we see so the JSON update for the latest version submitted to all Fedora branches. Yeah. 
yeah, no, nobody gives karma for my updates <laughs> because nobody installs the development packages. <laughs> right. Okay, we can remove the 30 JSONs, uh, this git clone, and that should do it for now. That one is still running. Um, okay, the last example I wanted to talk about was updating two interdependent crates. Is this still interesting? Yes, okay. Um, I know that there have been new releases for some crates that are called this error and this error impl. When we look at the Rust this error package, uh, let's, let's look at Let's look at impl first, because I know we need to build impl first, and then the other one. We can just update to the new version. All good, all green. That's also new with the latest Rust to RPM version. I actually made the, uh, screw, uh, the program output a lot nicer. Um, where is it? There it is. Uh, standard Rust package with, yeah, there's nothing special about this. The only special thing is that it's actually an implementation of macros. So this crate is uh, basically contains code that generates code, which is always interesting when you want to do metaprogramming. Now, what are the differences? Okay, I can see I have removed some markdown markup from the summary. And let's do that again because RPM doesn't run the markdown. Uh, then the other changes are trivial, just uses SPDX for the license string and bumps the version from 30, uh, 1031 to 1032. No other changes. Let's build that. That should work without problems. We can, while that runs, look at the other package. Well, 300% new tab. for the new version. No special messages from Rust to RPM. Generated spec file looks really normal. The diff is really short too. There's just different version of Rust to RPM. Bump from 1.0.31 to 1.0.32 using SPDX license expression. So basically the same diff in this package as in the other one. Okay, the build for the first package was successful. That's always nice. And then we run the same one here. Mock build for Fedora 35. And we should see an error message during dependency resolution. Right, no matching package to install create this error impl 1032. And that's the one we built here. So the this error create always requires the matching version of the this error impl create. So those two always need to be updated together. There's a few uh, projects that are split into multiple crates like this for various reasons. In this case, because uh, the macros always need to be in a separate crate because they're built differently. So those two crates 
will always need to be updated together. And in this case, we just test whether that actually works. First, this error impl, first this error with the chain command for mock and the post install command to make sure all the packages we built are actually installable. And now it's building the first package and then the second package by using the first package as a dependency or making the first the build results from the first build available as dependencies for the second build basically and that shouldn't take too long and it should work at least it worked two days ago when i tested the demo Okay, um, I think technically my session ends at uh, ends right now, but I think we have time until the hour is over, right? So I think we still have a few minutes. Okay, perfect. Uh, I just want to show how to launch those builds in an on-demand site tag in Koji so that they're submitted together without breaking depend uh, dependent packages. I'll just see if the build actually succeeds. Now let's look up uh, the bug numbers for those new versions. This error impl and this error, I mark the bugs as assigned so nobody fixes them in between me looking for examples and today's workshop. We can run new sources, this error impl in this tab. Both builds were successful. Run new sources in this tab as well. Okay, commit. To version 0032 fixes red boxilla number so and so and here update to version 0032 fixes red hat boxilla number 668 okay both packages uploaded and committed. Now I run the package request site tag. Now we get a new build target. I run git push the package build, but this time with a custom target. And for the, yeah, I, I usually run six builds in parallel and then chain build is a bit clunky because I usually start builds for Rawhide, Fedora 36 and Fedora 35 for the same package and then wait until they're all done and then launch the dependent builds for Fedora Rawhide and 36, 35. So chain build would take a lot longer because it serializes the builds instead of running those three in parallel. But yeah, I, I know that chain build exists. It can do that. Okay, interesting. I need to look at that. 
but I actually with with a, a shell aliases I've set up, it's really not much work to do it that way either. So um, okay, in a dependent package, we can run Koji wait repo and copy the name of the site tag we got. Where is it? Everything's so big, I can't find anything. Wait until this build is done in that site tag, and then git push and fat package build target in this target. And I could launch that now, but that would take a while because that build is still running in Koji. So I won't do that right now. I'll do that after the workshop is over and finish that update because I think our time is basically up. But I've actually covered everything I wanted to talk about. So, yeah. Anybody got any questions? Or can I finish the presentation? Yeah, I, I hope it was interesting because there's a lot of technical details that are a bit unusual when you talk about Rust packaging, uh, especially all the generated requires and provides and built requires and the generated sub packages and Rust to RPM with the configuration file. And sometimes you need to do weird things to make system bindings work the way you need them to work. And yeah. Yeah. Having more people would be great. <laughs> um, I already showed the slide where you can find the Rust SIG members and in the first slide, there were all my other ways you can poke me. Hey, I need, I need some Rust package or Rust fix or something. Yeah, you know where to find me. Right. right. Thanks for showing up, everyone. I hope it was interesting for beginners. And I hope it wasn't too complicated. <laughs> Right. Okay. Bye.